Hey folks, this is Frankly Vegas, where we eat as you'd eat. We experience places anonymously so that we can report back on them honestly. Today, we'll soon take you through to Palette, Tea Lounge, and Dim Sum in Las Vegas, which we visited a few weeks ago. But before we jump into that, let's rewind the clock back a little bit and give a brief background, because we feel that some context might be relevant here. Just to help set the stage, I believe I may know a thing or two about dim sum. I can't count how many times I've had it in California during my formative years there. I was fed dim sum when dim sum carts were standard so you can just point to what you want, rather than try ordering it from a menu with vague names, lacking any help in the form of photos to accompany the name of the dish. Here's just a tiny sample of some of the places I've been to, such as the following in the San Gabriel Valley in Southern California. The ones that are currently operating include NBC and Sea Harbor, 888 Seafood, as well as Atlantic Seafood and Dim Sum and Capital Seafood. Some of these are classics that have since closed, such as Ocean Star, the massive place it was, Elite. Then there was Triumphal Palace, the Yum Cha Cafe that was at this market when it used to be called Shun Fat. Then there was Dim Sum in New York City Chinatown that I've had, such as at Jing Fong Restaurant. And finally, I've dined at the birthplace for dim sum, notably having visited a popular dim sum chain in the Guangzhou area called Dian Du Da on at least three separate occasions when I traveled there for work, which is the best dim sum I've ever had so far. So I believe I may know a thing or two about dim sum. Now, a quick caveat. We understand that comparing dim sum places in the US or even Palette Tea Lounge for that matter against those in Asia is unfair. It's not even a fair fight. That would be like Doug DeMuro pitting the McLaren P1 against a Toyota Prius. Sure, Doug doesn't need to mention that both have four tires, but he has mentioned that both looks felt in their own way. But if you're stuck in a weird alter universe and with all things being equal, you only have these two cars to choose from. The Prius is accessible to most of us, while the McLaren P1 isn't. This is an awful attempt at us setting the scenario up that easily falls apart, but bear with us. But anyhow, we've also eaten at a few other dim sum places in the Las Vegas Valley too. And we feel that overall, the dim sum scene in Vegas is not bad actually. Which brings us to the Pallet Tea Lounge and dim sum in Las Vegas. The story of Pallet Tea Lounge and dim sum starts in San Francisco. Over the years, they've expanded and have grown something of a mini empire. Given their background and experience, we were eager to try them out. They've been receiving significant hype on social media for quite some time and continues to draw crowds. On the day of my visit, as soon as they opened, there was a line extending nearly around the front of the restaurant. We decided to stop by to see if Palette Tea Lounge lived up to the hype. Let's check out what they have to offer on their menu. Feel free to hit the pause button at any time to get a closer look at the details. The first section we see here is their offerings of signature dim sum. Next, we see their list of classic dim sum. Next, we see stone milled rice crepe, which is interesting because I can't recall seeing it on a menu being described as being stone milled. Next, we see their classic appetizers, followed by a section simply called palate signature, which appears to be maybe their popular notable dishes from their other locations carried over to this Vegas location. Next, we see live seafood followed by soups, which I find interesting that it's only served at dinner for some reason. Below that is their statement about service charges or gratuity. Next, we see vegetable and tofu. And then next is dessert. The next section are their rice and noodles. Moving on to a section of drinks. And then finally, we see more drinks, more specifically tea, soft drinks, and Fuji water. And that's our look at their menu. Okay, let's jump into the food. Let's start out with the soft shell crab rice crepe, which was a good start. This was Palette Tea Lounge's version of the usual rice rolls filled with meat that you'll find at other dim sum places. The wrapping here was not mushy with a stretchy and bouncy texture, similar to those found at other decent dim sum places. And it's got a good amount of soft shell crab inside. At typical dim sum places, you don't often find soft shell crab, but instead some of the options you'd usually expect are beef, cha siu, pork, and shrimp. The soft shell crab was a nice twist and tasted like they prepped it in a similar way to how Japanese restaurants make soft shell crab. A thin, crisp, deep fried layer on the outside and with tender meat inside. The rice crepes have furry khaki generously sprinkled on top, helping add character by adding flavors that help make the crepe pop. The soft shell crab and the furry khaki are signs of Palette Tea Lounge, bringing their own creative take to the dim sum status quo. Next up, the radish cake with XO sauce. The outside has a crunch that's crispy from being wok seared. The inside is soft, but completely pulverized into a paste a bit too much and too creamy beyond the point of being pleasant. It's past the point of being pleasantly velvety. 
The texture is definitely not grainy, which is what you usually feel with a more typical or homemade version. I think there's a way to make the texture pleasantly creamy and enjoyable, but something was a bit off-putting how it was too creamy, if that's even possible somehow. The scallions and exo sauce with seafood on top add some character to the dish. The scallions add a pop, a slight oniony kick, and a bit of sweetness. And the XO sauce gives savoriness and a bit of a seafood note, and also provides a firm texture in bites that contain XO sauce. Now we move on to the lobster har gao. The novelty for this specific har gao here is not only to use lobster meat as a filling, but also to provide a small capsule to inject butter into it. Unfortunately, execution fell short here when the wrapping fell apart and broke too easily, which meant that anything, especially any broth or steam or other contents, could spill out, which includes the drawn butter. They also have some bits of yo tiao, which are those long pieces of Chinese fried dough sticks. The yo tiao helped add a bit of crunch to the character. The filling was not bad, but it didn't leave an impression, with the flavor being muted and on the bland side. It was difficult to detect any lobster flavoring here. Texture was straightforward too, not mealy, but not firm and snappy. Okay, here we now see chicken claws and black bean sauce, which is usually known as chicken feet in other dim sum places. When it arrived, it appeared to be nicely braised with that deep rich brown color and topped with a few slices of chili peppers. This serving was okay to me. Not surprising, just typical. A bit tougher and leaner in texture than from other places where it's usually more tender and gelatinous. There's some sporadic chili seeds for a tiny bit of heat and there wasn't much of the salted, fermented black beans on the bottom. Coming up next are classic shrimp dumplings, also known as ha gao. There's nicely sized pieces of shrimp. The shrimp are adequately fresh, not mealy, and have a standard level of shrimp flavor to them. There's some hint of celery flavor, which is good and traditional. Wrapping is straightforward and standard with the standard amount of give and tear that it provides. Let's now get into the black truffle crispy duck fried rice. This fried rice contains bits of asparagus, egg, small bits of duck sprinkled throughout, green onions, and you can taste the deep, rich character of the wok sear or wok hay. The truffle flavor was present, though it would have been nicer if it made more of a presence, but not to the point where it overpowers the dish. The greasiness of the fried rice is just right and wasn't overly greasy. Presentation was standard as well, nothing to write home about. However, the price is quite steep and overall not sure if the price is justified. The Sichuan seafood dumplings are up next. They're drizzled in a chili oil with Sichuan pepper flavor, so you get deep wok hay pepper and smoky flavors in a rich oil base, which is nice. There's watermelon, cucumbers, and scallions. The watermelon is slightly soft and have lost some crisp and freshness, but not close to being mealy. Cucumbers, meanwhile, are spot on with being crisp and fresh, and the ribbons of scallions are fresh and crisp. The lightness and sweetness from the watermelon, cucumbers, and scallions strike a nice balance with the heat and deep character of the chili oil. The wrapping was nice in that it has a very thin layer of crisp outside. The minced seafood filling has a pleasant firmness to it that speaks to its freshness with a shrimp-based flavor to them. The presentation was noteworthy for this dish. Now we see the palate pan-seared trio. The first of the trio was an okra with shrimp paste. The okra is good and fresh, where it tastes like a miniature version of an earthy squash. Another item is the red bell peppers with shrimp paste, where the bell pepper seemed tired. It didn't have any raw qualities to it, nor was it too soft and overcooked, nor prepped or cooked in a way that seemed to nicely complement the shrimp paste. Item number three is morels with shrimp paste. The morels have a bit of a crisp on outside with a slight nutty flavor. With any of the three items in this trio, the shrimp paste strives to be straightforward, but felt and tasted slightly on the tired side as well. All pieces were small and doesn't seem to require much skill to make. Overall, this dish fell flat, struggling to impress in ingredients, skill, value, or presentation, especially at its price. Now let's talk about the Shaolong Bao which uh, come in individual cups that resemble a modified Chinese soup spoon. Maybe the idea here is since a soup spoon is usually used as a stage to eat the Shaolong Bao to allow the Bao to sit in seasonings and condiments. But also, once you bite through the wrapping, the soup spoon is used to prevent you from losing the broth inside that they'll do this for you using these modified soup spoons. This way, you don't have to struggle trying to assemble everything in a spoon, usually not large enough to fully contain the flood of juices oozing from the Bao. This is a nice touch. They come with a tiny dish of pellets of dark vinegar that you add into each cup and gradually dissolve over time. Regarding the Shaolong Bao itself, it's quite soupy inside with the soup tasting rich in pork flavors. The filling has a standard flavor and texture with minced pork. For tea, we ordered their Jasmine Chrysanthemum Tea, which was mild and mellow and has some citrus and floral notes to it. Meanwhile, the staff at Palette Tea Lounge was friendly and we recognized their effort, but they slipped up a bit with our bill and forgot a few of the dishes we ordered. 
The place tries for a trendy, modern look with a dash of ethnic flair, but it kind of feels like they went a tad overboard with being plastic fantastic. The ambiance has a vibe to see or be seen. Music-wise, there was some low-key dance pop playing, making it easy enough to chat without having to shout. People showed up in everything, from laid-back outfits to something a bit more snazzy, fitting the lounge's mixed vibes. Finding a spot wasn't too bad. We parked in the lot shared with the rest of the shopping center. Even though they've been open for a bit, it feels like they're still trying to get their act together. To wrap things up, this is our first visit to any Palette Tea Lounge location anywhere, whether we're talking about Vegas or the San Francisco Bay Area, or any of the restaurants that seem to be part of their collection. Simply put, our experience falls short. Is Palette Tea Lounge the dim sum equivalent of a Prius or a McLaren P1? Probably neither. Maybe for those who've been to Palette Tea Lounge's other locations, they enjoy reminiscing about the sentimental aspects that this new location in Vegas provides to them without the need to book a flight out to the Bay Area. But for those for whom Palette Tea Lounge would be their first visit to any of their locations, such as ourselves, we feel that there are better dim sum options in Vegas. The hype certainly made it seem like the McLaren P1 of dim sum, but there seems to be a mismatch between our own Palette and Palette Tea Lounge. If you like this video, please feel free to give it a thumbs up. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button on our channel so that you won't miss any of our upcoming experiences.